Praise God. Will you turn to the book of Zechariah once again? You should be getting used to where it is by now. Zechariah 8. Does anybody feel an increase in the temperature of oppression? Well, it's going to increase more and more, just to encourage you. But you know, there's a a chorus that says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our thoughts and hopes to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. There's also another verse that says, oh, what grace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we often bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Let's just bow our heads in prayer as we come before him. Heavenly Father, we give you praise today because you are above all things. You are in all things because you made all things. You created us in the image of yourself and you have recreated us in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may come to you as little children to be strengthened, to be encouraged, to be comforted. And Lord, we come to you today to receive of you, but also to lift you up, to acknowledge you as Lord, as sovereign Lord over all things. And Lord, our desire is to bring all things to you today, to lay all our problems, all our troubles, all our strife, at the foot of the cross and leave it there. We look up to you, Lord, our healer, our deliverer, and our strength. And we pray that, Lord, you would be mighty with us today, that your Holy Spirit would fill this place. And that you would bless each and every one in it. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Zechariah chapter 8. Is everyone there? Verse 1. Again the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. And I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet be old men and old women Dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be marvellous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvellous in my eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, in truth and in righteousness. Thus there is the Lord God, sorry, the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of the hosts was laid that the temple might be built. For before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beasts, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men 
everyone against his neighbour. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts, for the seed shall be prosperous. The vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their dew, and I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you, When your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not, so again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear you not. These are the things that you shall do. Speak you every man the truth to his neighbour. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbour, And love no false oath. For all these these things are all these things that I hate, saith the Lord. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fifth month, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy, and gladness, and cheerful feasts. Therefore love the truth and peace. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. God bless the reading of his word. Praise God. Well, here we are, at chapter 8 of Zechariah. Over halfway now. And I've called this this particular message, this chapter 8, to rightly divide the word of truth. To rightly divide the word of truth. And this eighth chapter really is is a continuation of the previous chapter. It's a continuation of the revelation that God began in chapter 7. Or if you like, it's another side of the same coin. The last one was a word to those who would rather, um, who had lived rather, in perversion of his truth. They'd gone through the motions, do you remember? He spoke to those who had gone through the motions. They prayed because they felt it was a duty. It was something that they had to do because they were in captivity. Now, out of captivity, why do we need to pray or fast anymore? And God brought a strong word to them. This chapter, however, is a word to those who would rather live in obedience to the Lord our God. Obedience to the spirit and truth of his word. And I say that purposely. In spirit and in truth. Because we saw last time they were obeying the truth. They were obeying the call to fast and pray, weren't they? But they'd forgotten the spirit of that truth. But we do it because we love the Lord. It's something that comes out of our love for him, not out of blind obedience to a set of rules and regulations. And so here we are, a word to those who would rather live in obedience to the spirit and truth of God. 
And that reminded me when I first started this this message of John chapter 4, verse 24. A verse that's well known. It says, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He demands nothing less than we worship him in spirit and in truth. We've already heard today that many of us, if not all of us, are feeling the heat of the battle. We're feeling the pressure of oppression of the enemy. We're feeling the attack and we're feeling the heat increase against us. But God is above all that. God is higher than all these earthly things and all the things that the enemy would throw against us. And that is the truth. That is the truth. However, to get back to our text. The chapter falls really into two distinct halves. One half is a little bit bigger than the other half. But it's two distinct halves and we're going to look at it in that way. To begin with, we're going to look at a section that I've called Behold, all things are become new. Behold, all things are become new. And it, this first section really reminds me of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And why does it remind me of that? Well, the old temple and the old covenant had now gone. Yes, the old covenant had now gone because there was no way to fulfill it. Old things are gone. Behold, God was going to bring all things new. And this is what he's promising throughout Zechariah. He laid out the framework in the first six chapters of what he was going to do. He showed Zechariah exactly what was going to happen, what he was going to look like. And now he's going into the detail. We saw the judgment that was going to come, didn't we? First of the church and then of the world. And now God is going through to tell and encourage this remnant because that's what they are. And that's what we are. We are the remnant of God in this place at this time. They were the remnant of God in their place at their time. God called them as such. Called them the remnant. The first section really is from verse 1 to verse 17. And it really seeks to apply oil and wine into the situation to counter the surgical strike of chapter 7. Do you remember chapter 7? It was pretty harsh. Now he's encouraging those who truly believe, those who want to draw close to God, those who want to see his kingdom built again, those who want to see the temple and Jerusalem glorious, with his presence dwelling in it, because that's what God's promised. And so God is speaking to this remnant, and he's bringing oil and wine, he's bringing encouragement and strength, strength of purpose to carry carry on, not to give up, because of what's ahead. A little of what we've heard this morning, I think. And it was aimed... To counter, as I've said, chapter 7, which really was dealing with people who just went through the motions. A picture of really of what was said in Isaiah in the following verses. Isaiah 29, 13 and 14. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their hearts, Far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. Isn't that exactly what we saw last week? 
The precepts of men. Oh, we've got to do this. Because it's what God expects. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvellous work among this people. Even a marvellous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Why? Because God was going to build his church. Now, however, having set out clearly how he would deal with the false followers in a previous chapter, God now turns his attention to the faithful remnant. And that's what we're dealing with today in chapter 7. He's dealing with the faithful remnant that love the Lord, that are so grateful they've been allowed the privilege to come back to the land and the honour and privilege of rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple of God. The city where God placed his name forever. And they are going to see this come to pass. The first section is subdivided into several different sayings, if you like, each showing a different aspect of what God is saying, a different aspect of what God is doing. Verse 2, God once again declares his jealousy over Jerusalem. He's jealous for Jerusalem. And he repeats that because he said it already in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 14. He's jealous over his city and his people. Not only the city, but also for the people that he had created to be his people. He created them out of Abraham, a Gentile. He created them a nation to call his own. And he loved them, even though he had to rebuke them and chastise them. He created them to be his own, as we can see in the next scripture. Deuteronomy 10, verse 15. Deuteronomy 10, verse 15. Only the Lord had had delight, sorry, only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. Because only he could. They were nothing special, nothing great. They were a small and a weak people. But he loved them. The saying goes that God chose his love and he loved his choice. And he chose their seed after them. Even you above all people as it is this day. God loved his people. Still loves his people. And God will deal kindly with the faithful remnant of his people. To which we have the honour and privilege of being grafted in. What an amazing thing that is. God would not reject them completely. And with the faithful remnant, he would fulfill his plans and purposes, not just for them, but for all mankind. This fact would never change and will never change. Verse 3 has God repeating and confirming his promise that came in chapter 2, that he himself would dwell in the midst of them. Do you remember that? He would be a fire around them and he would dwell in that city with them. His own presence, talking, yes, ultimately of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, where there's no need of the sun, the natural sun, because the light of God would light everything. Are you looking forward to that? Me too. He himself would dwell in the midst of them. And that contrary to that that was seen in the last chapter, this would be a city and a people of truth. Did you recognise that? Did you see that in in that verse 3? A city and a people of truth. Of truth. Spirit and truth. And in verse 4 and 5, I'm going through this quickly because there's so much. In verse 4 and 5, we see the promise that there would be both old men and old women in that city leaning on the staff 
for age. And I could go into so much about that, about an old man of a hundred would seem as a young man in Scripture. But we see this picture, you know, of old men and old women leaning on a staff or a stick or a cane because of their old age, their great age, plus many children playing in the streets. You know, old age is seen as a blessing for faithfulness in Scripture. As we can see in this next Scripture, Proverbs 16, verse 31. Old age is seen as a blessing for faithfulness. Proverbs 16, verse 31. The hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Praise the Lord. A hoary head is a silver-headed man. Blessed are you, Arthur. Hallelujah. And children are seen in a similar light in Scripture. Psalm 127, verse 3 says this, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Psalm 127, verse 4 and 5 say this, go on to say this, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Happy is a man whose quiver is full of them. Some have many children. Our quiver is full of one big arrow. (laughs) But we're so grateful for it because he's in the Lord. And praise God for it. Be grateful for your children. Be grateful. Bring them up in the ways of the Lord. Because they are a gift of God for faithfulness. Verse 6 God seeks to answer their apparent astonishment at this promised blessing. They, they seem astounded that this could happen, that such blessing, such richness, should, such bounty would occur, seeing what the situation was at their time. The land was barren. Buildings had been destroyed, flattened. The city was in the process of being rebuilt. So was the temple, even though by this time it would be almost finished. But they were astonished, owing to their present low estate. And contrary to the fact that it would have seemed impossible at the time to envisage such a glorious picture of both Jerusalem as a nation and the people as a whole. God was assuring the small remnant, as it is today, that it was certainly going to happen. He's speaking to you today that his word is sure. His word is settled in heaven. His word will never fall, fail. His word will be fulfilled. As impossible as it may seem now, in your situation, in your circumstances, God, if you trust him, he will bring you through. And you will see the glory of the Lord. What did Jesus say to the woman? Only trust, only believe, and you will see the glory of the Lord. That's no less sure for you today than it was for her then. God will bring it to pass. And this is what he was assuring in these words to this remnant of the people of Israel. Verse 7, God declares that to this small remnant again that he would bring his people, believers, from every corner of the globe, from the east, from the west, from the north and south, to achieve his will. Has he done that? Is he doing that? Yes. Do you know the numbers for Alia, the numbers of people coming back to the land of Israel, is the highest this year it's been for five years. God is bringing his people back home. 
And he's drawing those who trust him and believe in him together in pockets all over the world to draw them together on that one glorious day. He will achieve it, brothers and sisters. He said it and he will do it. Verse 8, we see that in verse 8, unlike those in, in the previous chapter, these would be there because of their existing real relationship with God. They'd be there willingly. They'd come willingly, not out of a sense of duty, but because they wanted to draw near to God. Do we see that today? You are fulfilling these verses. People who are gathering together all over this nation, all over this world, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in spirit and in truth, are fulfilling these verses today. God is doing it in our sight. Not just a mere sense of religious duty, but a love that comes out of a renewed life, a renewed disposition, changed life through Jesus Christ. Verse 9 and 10 show us that God wanted them to strengthen themselves by first remembering what he'd already done. He brought them back to the land and through the prophets, the latest of which being Haggai and Zechariah and many others before that, had inspired them towards rebuilding. He'd inspired them to repent and commit their lives anew to him. Do you remember that? Way back in chapter 1. He challenged them that those who truly believe would repent and commit themselves to him and that he would accomplish in them glorious things. And he went on to show those glorious things that would come to pass. He stated them in his word and he set it and sealed it by his name and by his spirit. He had inspired them to begin rebuilding something as I said before, that would have seemed impossible when they first arrived back in the land. This small remnant, this bedraggled people, oppressed when they did start building, told to stop for a while. Trouble on every side. But God inspired them. God challenged them and they answered the call and began in belief, in faith, that God would accomplish it. And it's to the obedient that he's now speaking in Zechariah 7. I've said that before, but it's, I want you to understand that because you are the faithful in this day. And God is restating through Zechariah to you personally today that no matter what oppression, no matter what trouble, no matter what circumstances you are experiencing now, God's word is sure. Trust in him. Believe on him. And he will bring you through. But we have to bring it to him. We have to trust in him to do it. We have to believe in him. Not doubt him. Remember the chorus? Oh, what grace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Do you think the, the man that wrote that or the person that wrote that chorus had never experienced any problem? They wrote it because they'd experienced problem. And they'd seen God bring them through to victory. In spite of it. And that's his word to this people and that's his word to you today. Whoever is hearing this word. It's to the obedient that he's now speaking. They'd worked hard in, in faith and they'd seen the temple raised 
and the city being rebuilt before their own eyes. Something that would have seen, seemed impossible 20 years before. Now they're seeing it. And God is telling them, do you think this is good? Wait and see what it's going to be like. Because it's going to be glorious. It's going to be a place where the very glory of God Almighty is going to dwell. And you will be part in it. If you only believe and trust in him. Verse 11, verse 11 sorry, now brings a new emphasis. In this revelation. And it says this. But now. I will not be to the residue of this people. As in former days. Saith the Lord of hosts. I will not be. To the residue of this people. As I was in former days. What does he mean by that? It means now. That he's going to act in grace. And he'd need to act in grace. Until the time of Jesus Christ. Because this was still an imperfect people. And it would be still an imperfect people until the cross of Calvary. Until that sprinkling of blood could bring them perfection. Could bring them cleansing for those who believed in him through his work. And with these words God is setting out the pathway as it were. For the coming of the one who would fulfill his law and usher in the new kingdom. God was laying the pathway, if you like, for the coming of the one who would fulfill his word. No man could fulfill the law of God. We know that. It had to be a God man. Jesus, son of the living God. So grateful that he came willingly for us and dealt with sin once and for all for us. And for those who believe and though those who have been changed will be forever grateful for that sacrifice. Verse 12, I think, is, a, is an amazing piece of scripture. I want to read it again. Zechariah 8 verse 12 says this. For the seed shall be prosperous. The vine shall give her fruit and the ground shall give her increase. And the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all things. Now, I have to admit to you that I, when I read this about the third or fourth time, I was struck with awe. I really was struck with awe. Because on the surface, it looks like God is going to bless their natural harvest, their natural bounty, the fruit of the vine, the grain of the fields, the fruitfulness of the cattle and of the sheep. But you know, if you look closer, it reveals something far more glorious, far more amazing. The word seed there is the Hebrew word zara, zara. And for those of you who may have studied Hebrew and the words, that's exactly the same word that's used in Genesis 3 verse 15. The seed. The seed. The seed of Satan will bruise his heel. But this seed will crush his head. This seed is Jesus. It's a child. It's a seed. A person. And not only that, but the word prosperous there the prosperous, the word prosperous is the Hebrew word shalom. Wholeness, completeness, peace. To cap it all, this child who is peace 
will cause God's people to possess all things. Does that sound like somebody you know? That sounds a lot like the Son of the Living God. Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Seed, the King, the Prince of Peace, who causes all people who believe in him, God's people, to possess all things. Did you know you possess all things through Christ Jesus? That's what that verse is proclaiming. Let me read it again. For the seed, the seed, shall be prosperous, shall be shalom, shall be peace, and the vine shall give her fruit. Who is the vine? He is the vine, we are the branches. And the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all things through Christ. Hallelujah. Are you encouraged by that? I hope you are. That's such an amazing verse. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. The child who is peace shall cause God's people to possess all things. If that's not speaking about Messiah, what is? What a promise. And in verse 14 to 17, in these verses, the Lord reiterates that the judgment on the previous generation had run its full course. He wasn't going to treat the people like that anymore. There was no going to be any further captivity of Israel in that sense into a country. Yes, they were scattered. They're still God's people. And there's still many of them recognising Yeshua HaMashiach as their Messiah. And they are being brought back to the land. But he wasn't going to treat them with the harshness to which he had. This was to be a whole new start. One which God was going to make possible through the perfect sacrificial offering that was and is the Lord Jesus Christ. If man, I've just written this statement, if man could not fulfill his law, God was going to change man. And that's exactly what he did with you and with me. We could never fulfill the law of God. We couldn't. So God changed us through Jesus Christ so that through him we've already fulfilled the law. Through our changed life, our change, our new disposition in him, we fulfill it through our love for him and our love for each other. This is God's promise coming to fulfilment in our day. And this was what was promised through these verses and these chapters in Zechariah. I just want you to understand that. I want you to dwell on that. That God wasn't just speaking to them, he's speaking to you to encourage you today as the remnant of God. He loves you and he wants you to trust him no matter what the circumstances may be, no matter what the situation may hold. He loves you. And if you trust him, nothing will ever separate you from his hand. He said it. Do you believe it? I hope you do. Now the second part, I've called the promise of the new man. 
This is only three parts, really, three sections, three short sections. And it begins with verse 19. And verse 19 has God telling this people, this remnant, that as opposed to the previous people in the previous chapter, where fasting had been done as some drag, as some duty, as some thing that they had to go through, in the days to come it would be something that would be done out of love and out of a desire to draw near to God because of this new disposition. This new heart that was going to be put inside them. Because of the sprinkling with clean water and with the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's promising this to you and this is for you today. It was promised in their day and it's been fulfilled in our day. We come together not because we are felt bound to but because we love him. We want to worship him. And we want to be with each other. Because we love each other. And because we want to help each other. And encourage one another. And build each other in the faith. Isn't that true? Verse 20 to 22 shows God repeating something that had been promised before but had not yet been seen. And these are some examples of that. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Micah 4, verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow unto it. Isn't that what God was saying? That every tribe and tongue and nation would come to this city, to this place. Of course, more is stated if we were to read more of this particular verses but I think you get the idea there are more verses in scripture that back up what God has promised the nations are going to come nations from every tribe people from every tribe and tongue and nation on the face of this earth will come and worship him in spirit and in truth and we have it today We have it today in our very own fellowship. We have some from Brazil. We have some from Britain. Some have generations from Scotland or Ireland maybe. Or further afield from Greece. But people from every tribe and tongue and nation would flow to him. And eventually to the new Jerusalem where God will reign forever with him forever are you looking forward to that hallelujah hallelujah and then we come to the final verse verse 23 final verse in this chapter verse 23 thus saith the Lord of hosts in those days it shall come to pass The ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Does that mean that they are grabbing hold of him to accost him? To cart him off to prison? No. In this verse it shows that in the fulfilment of what God has been saying, in this ultimate Jerusalem, in this ultimate temple, in this ultimate place where God is going to dwell by his own presence, the fire of the presence of Almighty God, many from all tribes and tongues and nations are going to to touch, to grasp the robe 
of one who is a Jew and say, we will come with you because we've heard that God is with you. They're doing it because of the honour and the esteem that they hold the Jews in this day. Because then they will truly be the people of God. Then they will truly be the chosen. And the law will go out from Jerusalem. And the blessing from that wonderful place. And we see as well in this verse that we see a promise that not only Jews will occupy this new temple, this new city, but people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Yes, even us Gentiles have that privilege. And this is something which was going to be recognised by the Apostle Paul so many years later. I'm going to read Romans 16, verse 25 to 27. Romans 16, verse 25 says this. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God, only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. You know, this was a mystery. It was a mystery in Zechariah's day. All this stuff about every tribe and every tribe, every tongue, tribe and nation, would be a mystery to them. They wouldn't understand that Gentiles from every tribe and tongue and nation would come and flood into Jerusalem and be accepted in the temple where God himself would dwell. But this is what was promised. And this is what Paul recognised while he was writing this. This mystery had been now unveiled through Jesus Christ. Temple, the, the veil of the temple had been torn. Yes, God could come out. But man could also go in, into his presence through Jesus Christ. And it's also reflected in the words in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. You, brothers and sisters, are going to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Hallelujah. From every tribe and tongue and nation. God has promised it and God will achieve it. To those who will trust and believe in him, lean on him. Lean on him. Believe, only believe and you will see. The glory of God. The fact that these Gentiles take hold of the skirt of the Jew is actually showing the great respect and honour and esteem that they have for him. Because the word of God came through the Jewish people. The Messiah came through the Jewish people. And as far as I'm aware, the Messiah is still a Jewish person. And always will be. It also shows us that God has not finished with the Jewish people. God has not finished with the Jewish people or with the Jewish nation, as many in the church seem to believe today. In fact, they're going to play a major role in the temple, the major role in the city, the new city of Jerusalem. Remembering the fact that they are now They are the true olive tree into which we've been grafted. They are the true olive tree. We've been given the privilege and the honour of being grafted in with them. Supported by the root. The same root. Hallelujah. God indeed has a glorious plan. 
for his people. He has a glorious plan for you, brothers and sisters. And we're incredibly privileged to be a part of it. It's a great honour to be in God's family. And God has said it will come to pass because he will make it come to pass. He has promised and he will fulfil. And we've seen both in the last chapter and in this one, two sides of the same coin. What will happen to those who, who rebel and want to do things their own way? And what will happen to those who will obey and submit to the will of God? Hallelujah. The ones who disobey will face the judgment of God. However, those that surrender to the will of God and do it his way will both see and be a part of the glorious new Jerusalem. And the final question is, where does your future lie? God bless you. God bless you. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you that sometimes your word is is easy to hear but so hard to, to live. But we thank you that you are our strength. You are our shield. You are the stronghold that we can run into and be safe. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to humble ourselves. And to run to you, to flee to you in time of trouble. Not to trust in our own strength, not to trust in our own ways, but to lean on you and trust in you to bring us through. Because you are faithful and true. And so is your word. Your word is truth. And we thank you that we don't just have your word we now have your Holy Spirit to bring, to reveal the hidden truth in your word through Jesus Christ. Lord, burn that truth in our hearts and minds in these last days. Help us, Lord, to be amidst all the overpowering and overshadowing darkness. Help us to be those lights set on a hill and help us to lean on you, Lord, and to depend on you and your strength to keep that light burning brightly. For we ask it in the name of and for the glory of the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.